Welcome to the SEI Podcast Series, a production of the Carnegie Mellon University Software Engineering Institute. The SEI is a federally funded research and development center sponsored by the U.S. Department of Defense. A transcript of today's podcast is posted on the SEI website at sei.cmu.edu slash podcasts. Hi, my name is Suzanne Miller. I'm a principal researcher here at the Software Engineering Institute Software Solution Division, and today I'm thrilled to be joined by my friend and colleague, Dr. David Zubro. He has been the lead of the Software Engineering Measurement and Analysis Initiative. He is recently retired from full-time work. I am insanely jealous of him, and he is, but he's come back for part-time work with us. Thank you, Dave. And we're going to talk to him as part of our series on how did you get into software engineering and cybersecurity and help people understand why they might want to be part of this exciting industry. Um, he has been with CMU for over 30 years. He's been with the SEI for 29 of those years. He had a hand in starting and maturing lots of different things, including the capability maturity model and the, the measurement and analysis work that is well known in many circles, especially of the DOD. So I want to welcome you, Dave, and thank you very much for joining me today. Thanks, Susie. It's great to be here. So let's start off by having you tell us about yourself and what is it that actually brought you back after retiring? Um, so what's the kind of current work that you do so people get an idea of what would make it exciting to be an SEI kind of person in measurement analysis of all things? Well, what brought me back is, uh, you know, I really enjoyed the work and we're doing a uh, project right now, applying some machine learning techniques uh, for diagnostic purposes of um, engines and part of the sustainment activity. And it's a terrific challenge. I, one of the reasons I came back is not because it was easy. It's because it's been so hard. Um, and so there's still more to be done with that. And the other reason is, is to assist with the transition. I've been in, I was in my position for a long time. Uh, and so mature, and I'm sure we'll talk about this later, but matured the group. It's been through a lot of phases of activity, um, and development cycles. And so I just wanted to help assist with some of the transition, close out some of the work. So, cause you're a nice guy and you're not going to leave us hanging and we appreciate that. <laughs> All right. So let's go back and help people understand a little bit about your career here at the SEI. What brought you to the, and who brought you to the SEI? And tell us a little bit about some of the different roles that you've had during your tenure with us. Well, um, I ended up at the SEI in, in sort of an interesting way. I had been a graduate student and my colleague, Jane Siegel, ran what was called the Empirical Methods Group at the SEI back in 1992. <clears throat> and at that time, Bill Curtis was yep. the process program manager. And Jane knew me and uh, I was actually in the midst of uh, <laughs> moving, switching jobs from working at the Carnegie Mellon uh, administration. I was the assistant director of analytic studies there and was going to take a biomedical research position at Pitt. And uh, ended up talking with Jane a little bit and she was like, well, why don't you come over here? And I interviewed and the rest, as they say, is history. Uh, came to the SEI and actually not too long, about a year and a half after, Jane went back to campus and I became the manager of the empirical methods group, and which then led into the SEMA group. So you and I were, were uh, came into the SEI around the same time. I came in as a resident affiliate in 92. And, From Lockheed. Yep, that was in, in I, those days. Back in the day. Um, 
I just want people, I want you to tell people about the very special Macintosh that you had in your office at the SBI. That I turned into a fish tank. That's the one. <laughs> <laughs> so what made you decide that a Macintosh should become a fish tank? <laughs> I just thought it was a nice way to have, it was actually the cover of the back, right? So, uh, but I had upgraded my, I guess my original Mac to a Mac SE and they gave, put a new cover on it. And I thought, oh, this will fit right over my little fish tank. Uh, I'll but never so forget the first time I walked in and the saw the fish going around. And so yeah. so that, that tells people a little bit about your sense of humor. Um, and it also points to the fact that I know you have a, a longstanding love of the ocean and sea creatures. And um, and so just to give people an idea about, before we get into sort of job things, a little bit about what's your favorite thing to do out in the ocean? Well, I scuba dive. I've been doing that for over 20 years, 20 something years. And um I just find it very peaceful and calming to just be underwater and watching the various creatures. Uh, you know, and I've had the good fortune to be able to go to quite a few places around the world yep. Yep. Uh, to indulge that hobby. And and you meet a lot of wonderful people and experience a lot of cultures along the way. So it's, it's definitely. And, and one of the things thing. I expect to see in your retirement is a gallery showing of your underwater photography, because I've been one of the people that has been fortunate enough to see the pictures that you've shared and the photographs you've shared of some of the creatures that you have encountered. And one, there's some of those I go, I sure I'm glad I wasn't that close to that thing. And two, they, they are quite beautiful. So, um, you know, not you're not just a measurement geek. You are also an artist. And so that's oh, you know, sort well, of thing to, to bring out that, that we aren't just one dimensional here at the SEI. And um, and you in particular are one of the people I look at in terms of having a really nice balanced life. So well, thanks. Um, I hope I'll I see a gallery showing somewhat sometime soon. Yeah, be, because I haven't been able to go diving, um, I take pictures of birds. Yeah. And, <laughs> and I actually set up my desk for work at home near my bird feeders. And ah, there you, go. Few, there you go. I had a few pictures published in the Post-Gazette. There you go. Um, back in May. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. Well, we're going to see more of Dave Zubra, the photographer, I think. Yeah. All right. Let, let's right. let's flip back to sure. uh, your work at the SEI. You have done a lot of things that I am very proud of. The SEI, you know, having done. What is the thing that you're most proud of um, in terms of your work here at the SEI? What is the thing that that you say, you know, I see an impact that I have made for our sponsors and for the world and you know for people that are working in this industry. So. I, I thought about this question a little bit um, because probably, and I'm not going to directly answer your question right now um, as asked, but, you know, I think one of the things that I'm proudest of is actually the SEMA team and what it's been able to accomplish and how it has kind of flowed with changes in the field. This kind of goes back to the the actual name. It, you know, there used to be software process measurement. And when the empirical methods group and the software process measurement groups joined, I insisted that we add the word analysis and call it software engineering measurement and analysis because the measurement side of things is important, fundamental, but you also need the analysis to, and I like to say we want to, we want to make our work kinetic in terms of driving action 
right? And a lot of it's been around process improvement, project management. Um, but if, if the results of the analysis aren't acted upon, then it's sort of for naught. And so being able to get the team to do that and continue with that work is one thing that I'm proud of. A couple of work products uh, sort of, you know, break it up over some years. The maturity profile was sort of my trial by fire in a way of coming into the SEI. Um, I took that on and thank goodness I had Bill Curtis's support because back in those days, the very early days of CMM, there was a desire and folks had produced an early version of the maturity profile, but it was hard to get the data from people. Mm -hmm. And, you know, even in the SEI, there was a certain ownership of assessment results and not wanting to put them in a central repository. There was a des desire to, all this had to be very close hold. So I had to earn the trust of people inside the building. I had to in, uh, earn the trust, especially as it grew, of the various assessment providers or vendors, people conducting assessments, the companies being assessed, and then turn it into an analytic product that everybody felt was valuable and that they wanted. And so the community maturity profile, and it lived on for a long time, I mean, long after I was responsible for it, uh, was one thing. The other one <coughs> was getting the um, DOD software fact book done. And this was sort of a, a funny one, and, and I don't know if you have had this experience or not, but we sometimes will publish things and you get no feedback whatsoever. Yeah. You just don't know. It's like, was that valuable? Was all that effort and time and care and angst over it worth it? Um, and then lo and behold, you could be just somewhere at a meeting or meet somebody and somehow the conversation goes around. Like, oh yeah, we use that all the time. And what a wonderful feeling it is <laughs> to get that feedback. Yeah. But there's nobody out there that's sort of directly, you know, providing that. Um, when you deliver a course, when you do some training, you'll get some immediate feedback from people. And that's always a very good feeling or you're working closely with the customer and um, you you help them actually accomplish something and you sort of get that immediate feedback. But some of the, the work that we do, it's sort of open loop. You put it out there and, and you don't necessarily get the, the feedback back. So those, I mean, I, those are a couple of thoughts that, that that came to I, I want to. So one of the things that that when I was thinking about you know our interactions and different things that have affected my work um, from SEMA, one of them actually is the modification that that SEMA made to a model that's used a lot um, in helping people to set goals and measure against them in software and other areas. The what's called the GQM framework, the Goal Question Metric framework. And SEMA added in the concept of indicator. Our version of it is GQIM. Right. And, and basically that indicator addition forces people to think about the visualization, the analysis, what is it we're gonna do with it? And I gotta say, that is one of the things, you know, in my work that I use probably more than anything that SEMA has produced over, over the last 30 years, because it's that missing link of between capturing the measures and answering the questions. Because if I visual, if I give you a visualization that is meaningless, then we can't do, we can't answer the question. We can't know if we met the goal. So, so make forcing people or not forcing, but encouraging people to spend time on that layer of how you look at things. I actually think is a really important contribution. Um, it may be like a small thing in your own mind, but I just want you to know that, 
since you back to that open loop. I use it all the time, Dave. <laughs> well, good. And you know what? Um, a couple of points about that because I obviously I I agree with you, and a, and a a couple of reasons um, for that that step in there. Often, it is the consumable by a decision maker, you know, and going back to let's keep things action oriented, make things, you know, my, my physics analogy, kinetic versus potential energy, you know, uh, you got a bunch of data, you got some measures, there may be some potential in there, but it, it hasn't been transformed yet. Um, so getting people to think about what is the indicator you you sort of get are automatically getting their buy-in too, in terms of what they they'll actually use and what they see is valuable. Because you you know we use it as an elicitation, sketch it out, draw me the x and y axes. What's the data that's going in here? Are we showing it over time? You know all this stuff, and you get people to draw, and then they can you know do it on a whiteboard. No no no, I don't think I think it should look like this. Da 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 da. Go 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 for it. Um, that's one thing. The other thing is, is that once you have the picture, then you can start to say, okay, what is the data we need to collect? Right. And so now all the data has a home. It has a purpose. Right. 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 And so it has a place to be. And so in organizations, Right. A lot of times the data providers aren't the managers, the consumers of the output. And so the, the people providing the data often like to know, how's this going to be used? Right. And so now you can tell them. Exactly. And, and you can and the end, you can ask them, you, you know, when we do the elicitation, we'll ask, go back and ask them the people whose processes are involved or who are going to be responsible for generating the data, here's what we're trying to do. What's the best way for us to collect this? Yep. And get them to participate in the process. You know, it makes it a lot less, a lot more collaborative and a lot, and it sort of knocks down some of the potential suspicions and mistrust about how are you going to use that data, for, you know, um, so yeah, I mean, we find, uh, GQIM to still be relevant. People, Absolutely. I, I still do encounter people who are using it, even though we've kind of, you know, our current research and development activities uh, have sort of gone off into the, um, you know, machine learning worlds. But I think that it's an example of something that has actually transitioned very well and is a sustainable, it's self-sustainable. Um, and, you know, those are things that, that I think the SEI needs to celebrate because we don't always celebrate that we don't have to pay attention to this anymore. It's become part of the DNA of how we go about certain things. And that that's the one for me that, that really stood out. Well, so, yeah. so let's give people okay. a little bit of idea about uh, what got you here in terms of your early influences growing up and and your college years? You know, what is it that made made this such a good fit for you and the goals that you had early on? Think about when you were like in eighth grade. Maybe not. <laughs> uh, okay, so we'll try to not go back quite that far and we'll... <laughs> fast forward through some of these years. Um, but, you know, I was a child or am a child of the 60s. And, um, yeah, in the, into, you know, music, peace, love, rock and roll. Uh, but also was very much into sort of the, it sort of harkens into today somewhat, a lot of the social activism of that. Uh, <clears throat> when I went to college, uh, 
I actually thought I was going to end up in chemistry. I had, uh, I, I grew up near Westinghouse Research, and our local, our high school had a chemistry competition funded by Westinghouse. Oh. And so when I was in 10th grade, I came in, I think, fourth out of the entire high school. I thought, okay, I'll, this seems like something to do. I'll go to college for that. Um, <laughs> that lasted one one term up at Penn State. Then I did a, a term of, I thought, oh, I'm going to go into theater arts. So obviously there was no goal. <laughs> okay. There was a lot of, you know, let's try this, try that. And I went into material sciences, which is one of the hardest <laughs> disciplines up at Penn State. So then finally being done with my freshman year, I discovered up there what was what's called health planning and administration, and that clicked. It was focused on current issues, you know, health and welfare issues. It had a quantitative bent to it. That was kind of where that that became my focus. Um, looking at health policy, when I finished college. I took the summer off and drove around the country, came back to Pittsburgh, was looking for jobs, and also learned of this program at a local university called Carnegie Mellon. And back then, it was the School of Urban and Public Affairs. Again, a very public policy focus with um, some professors who were very interested in health healthcare policy. So I thought, well, while I'm looking for a job, I'm going to go interview with them. And they said, come on down. And um, then I got involved as a research assistant doing statistical analyses with the IBM 360 uh -huh. back then. And at that point in time, um, there was a very influential professor. I, mean, I was doing a lot of interesting kinds of data analysis for people, but there was a linkage with uh, Joel Tarr, who was starting a program called Applied History and Social Sciences and that was joint with engineering and public policy and the history department and, and SUPA, School of Urban and Public Affairs. So when I finished um, my master's, I, again, sort of was looking for a job and also thought, okay, let's explore this idea of going for a PhD. And so I ended up staying on campus and enrolling in a, the PhD program, what was applied history and social sciences at that time, and then the social and decision sciences department was established. Um, <clears throat> throughout all of this, I'm honing my computing skills. But, I, but I, you know, as you can tell from this story, I'm a social scientist at heart. I'm not, you know, I know statistics. Uh, really enjoy that kind of empirical research and data analysis, but I'm not a computer scientist. I just happened to pick up some skills, programming skills, as I was going along. Um, and so, you know, pursued the PhD, got a position in the central administration during my PhD work, met Jane Siegel, and we already know where that connection ended up. And we're glad that, that Jane Siegel made that uh, offer to you because I would not have had a chance to work with you all these years if not. Yeah. So uh, I do want to point out to our, our viewers that you're actually the first person to receive that particular PhD. So you you founded a, a padre, uh, you know, going forward and, and sort of made it possible for others to sort of see that possibility. And I, I think that's... Um, one of the things that I find to be uh, unique about your perspective is that 
I'm not a computer scientist. I'm a social scientist. I'm a statistician. And so I have different ways of looking at the problems that a computer science, in, in, than a, the way that a computer scientist might. And I know I'm among many who find that to be very useful and refreshing. And so I guess the point I want to make there is for the, the younger people that are out there, you know, watching this, you don't have to be a computer scientist to be successful and happy working in the computer uh, software engineering industry. You're a perfect example of, you know, coming at this sort of, you know, in a very roundabout way, but your contributions have been amazingly valuable over the years. And so um, I hope others will will sort of take that to heart. Um, speaking of observations, you've seen a lot. Um, you and I are of similar uh, sort of time frame. And, you know, you mentioned IBM 360, and that is not a laptop. That is a mainframe, right? So you and I both come from mainframe all the way to cell phones and you know, micro devices and internet of things. What are some of the things that, that you would observe about how the problems in this industry have evolved over the years? Give people a sense of sort of what's the difference between what you and I were dealing with in the 70s and 80s versus what we're dealing with now. Well, I think, um, I guess in a word, it would be the networks everything is connected to everything else. Um, that is certainly a big difference. You know, in the, the programming when I was growing up in, in all of this, you know, was pretty much sort of like one thread right through the program. Sure. You know, there was none of this interrupt driven kind of, you know, polling a device or a sensor for something to go on. No parallel programming. None of that was going on. Um, and you didn't have bandwidth for back and forth client server kinds of, if you will, kinds of interactions that seem seamless today. Um, you know, the, the languages were quite different. I never did program an assembler. So, you know, never did that. But, you know, Fortran and C. And then one of my favorites was APL. I knew you were going to say that. <laughs> and Snowball. <laughs> APL, for those that don't know, it is a very mathematically oriented language. And if you've got yeah. the, the sort of... The, the, the bent that Dave does, yeah, that's going to be a real attractive. It, it was it was a lot of fun um, doing things. Uh, Jim McCurley and I had a whole library of APL code we would carry around <laughs> with us from place to place. You know, what else is different? Well, I think over time, you know, certainly the complexity because of of the of everything we're asking you know it's everything we're asking software to do now you know um and you you hear this you know the f35 right is a computer with wings or you know and, and i mean we we say these things but a lot of the functionality in systems that used to reside in hardware or mechanical devices is now being digitized and, and handled with software. Uh, so that's another another big big change. Um, and, and just you know just the power uh, you know the old laptops I used to laugh about what's what's happening with the um, uh, the the early processors. What were the the eighty eighty six or eighty three eighty six 8286, you know, and say uh, they they've turned into Furbies. I mean, you know, <laughs> yeah. we, we we you know things that used to drive our computers are now toys. Yeah, right? yeah. Our our phones are much more powerful. Um, you know, a lot of the toys and games are way more powerful than 
things like the IBM 360. So, so a message there also is software is going to be around. It's not going away. And so if you're looking for a career that is going to persist, you know, there's lots of careers that will persist, but so, I think software is one of them. The languages are going to change. The focus, the power is going to change, but there's always going to be the need for people to interact with all of that power in a way that gives us useful functionality. Well, and so it's a pretty stable, you know, kind of career field in that sense. And and to your earlier comment, um, you know, you kind of have the low code, no code uh, movements, and this was something that, in a way, yeah, I thought about long ago too with even things like spreadsheets i mean the you know we have object orientation back then it was more procedural thinking can you actually think and if you can think and decompose a problem into a series of steps or a series of objects contained in and their interactions you can find ways to to take those lots and turn them into an application, yeah. a game, a something, yeah. you know, and there's a lot of support. So I think a lot of the individual creativity, um, it's become more democratized, maybe to use that word, or at least more pervasive. And, mm -hmm. and the barrier to entry is lower. It's, it's much lower than when we today. were. Younger. Yeah. So what is the most valuable piece of advice or lesson that you would offer to someone who's thinking about going into working in the field or that is already working in the field? Uh, Give us your wisdom. Let me think. You, you know, for people in the field, I'd say maybe two points. One is stay curious and keep looking ahead, listen to others. And then there's sort of the older fashioned part of me, which says, don't imagine yourself as being infallible. Test your code. <laughs> don't assume That's everything. What, don't assume on the happy path, as they say, and try and break it and see what it does. Um, you'll save everyone a lot of grief if you take that to heart and say, well, how, how could this go wrong? And challenge your own assumptions. Um, for people who are looking, looking into it, I'd say... Find something you're, find something, find a good problem that you're interested in, that you, that you care about, that you're, you might be passionate about and think about, even if it's just for yourself, if you want to get into doing some computing, what would make that easier? You know, in the past and, and even today, we see a lot of scripting languages tying different pieces of functionality together to meet an individual need. I mean, if you can envision it for others, Lord knows you might have the next big app, killer app. But it's finding the right problem. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, I'm sure, you know, find others with similar interests, talk and find out about it and then experiment. Um, and this does remind me of something from my past, because I used to teach um, administrative staff how to get familiar with the IBM PC, right? And the first thing I'd tell them to do was, okay, just lean on the keyboard. And I'd say, press all the keys down. And say, see, you didn't break it. It's okay. You're going to make mistakes. Everybody makes mistakes. You're not going to fry the machine. You're not going to damage it. So nowadays, that probably goes without saying. But the thing is, don't worry about making mistakes. 
you know, try, get into it. You'll get better. Right. It's like, if you don't make any mistakes, what's that? If you don't make any mistakes, you won't get any better because you Mm -hmm. won't learn what works and what doesn't. So, well, I want to thank you very much for joining us today. Um, I'm not going to ask you what you're going to do in your retirement because I already know (laughs) that you're back working, doing some hard problems with us. And I, I wish you the best. I actually look forward to maybe doing a, a podcast in the future about the results of some of the machine, machine learning research that you're you're continuing to do. And I really want to thank you for sharing your past, your present, your future, your, your hobbies with uh, all of our viewers so that they can see, you know, just I, I love being able to show people the people of software engineering right. and you're one of my favorite people. So um, well, thank you for joining us today. Thank and you, I please. look forward to talking to you in the, in the future. Um, any links that we mentioned uh, during this conversation, uh, we'll, we'll have links, uh, any, any resources we mentioned, we'll have links in the transcript. So, um, and I also want to thank you for the many years of service that you've given to the SEI and the Carnegie Mellon community, because um, I, for one, and I know many, many others really, really appreciate the work that you've done. Um, and you are one of the people that really exhibits our values. And, and I appreciate that in particular. So thank you, David. Thank you, Suze. Thanks much. Look forward to talking with you more, working with you more. Thanks for joining us. This episode is available where you download podcasts, including SoundCloud, Stitcher, TuneIn Radio, Google Podcasts, and Apple Podcasts. It is also available on the SEI website at sei.cmu.edu slash podcasts and the SEI's YouTube channel. This copyrighted work is made available through the Software Engineering Institute, a federally funded research and development center sponsored by the U.S. Department of Defense. For more information about the SEI and this work, please visit www.sei.cmu.edu. As always, if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to email us at info at sei.cmu.edu. Thank you.